Thank you. Welcome. It's so good to see so many faces. How's everyone doing? Good. Good. Thanks for asking. How are you? We're good. Thank you. We love when you join our sessions every Wednesday at 2 and every uh, Friday at 3. We have a super exciting session today, networking from your couch. And we have two special guests. And I'm going to introduce Paige. Everyone knows Paige. And I'm going to hand the mic over to Paige. And she can take it from here. Thank you, Mary. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you. So today, we're going to talk about networking from your couch with David Sarnoff. David Sarnoff is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Executive Leadership Coach with Loeb Leadership. As a former attorney, he's experienced executive search consulting. Business, he's been a business owner, a former Board of Education president, and he's uniquely qualified and experienced to understand the mindset, demands, and challenges of all of you, as well as attorneys, executive managers, and individual contributors. He's also the father of two teenage students, so he's completely understanding the whole online school setting that we have currently. David's an effective speaker and connects with his audience on a personal level. He's presented on topics including emotional intelligence, leadership skills, workplace conflict, organizational culture, presentation skills, and most importantly, interviewing skills. He's received his undergraduate degree at Hofstra and his law degree from Rutgers Law School. He's certified in emotional intelligence and full disclosure, he's my husband. So the good news is, this is probably the first time we've really worked together, but we practiced. So if, we, if there's a little bit of kidding, know where it's coming from, it's from a good place. And since we both do similar things and we love helping other people, I think it'll be a good session. But it'll work best if all of you really participate and put in questions in the chat room. So feel free to do that. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you so much, Paige, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I really enjoy working with college students and high school students. I, I've done multiple presentations uh, to college students on a variety of topics, and particularly when it comes to networking and interviewing and also pursuing uh, career opportunities. I, I spent over 18 years in executive search, and I was a partner in, in an executive search firm where I did a lot of coaching, consulting, and guiding people throughout through their career exploration, as well as preparing them for interviews, uh, giving them advice as far as how to discover what their true passions are, what excites them, and what industries or areas of specific uh, professions were of interest to them, and then how to pursue that. So first of all, I. I'll give a little bit of an introduction and then Paige can jump in with her questions. But I consider networking to be one of the most vital skills of any professional, uh, no matter what you do. Um, whether or not it's somebody who's in a trade, someone who's in a professional service, somebody who has uh, an advanced degree to, to do something specific, networking is always a vital part of achieving success within any particular profession, that's my opinion. Uh, I consider myself to be extremely, um, very much a people person. I love meeting new people, people who I haven't met previously, learning their story and discovering who they are, and then learning about their networks and how there might be opportunity and potential for me to meet people in their orbit that can guide me further into what I'm trying to pursue. So Paige, if you want to start with a specific question, that, that'd be great. So David has 8,500 contacts on LinkedIn, 8,500. And I know that some of you have less than 25. So David, if you can talk a little bit about how you are connecting with people, and what we can do while we're home, some of us sitting sure. on the couch, maybe some of us laying in bed, how we can continue to build our networks, even though it's virtual. Great. Uh, so I, I consider LinkedIn to be an incredibly valuable tool. In, in many ways, I, I believe it's also incredibly underutilized. And um, I spent years developing my LinkedIn network, and I really kept it focused 
to areas of which I had particular interest and relationships and connections in which would advance the cause of my profession. Uh, that's not to say I don't accept invites from people who may be completely outside of it, but I am pretty scrutinizing as to who I do connect with. with and I also reach out uh, to a lot of people. And it, it helps to have a little bit of a thick skin because not everybody is going to accept your invite. And it, it's, it, in some respects, it is a numbers game. But I have found LinkedIn to be incredibly beneficial for me to meet new people, to get business, and also to learn about other opportunities that I then share with other people who I believe would, would uh, benefit from, from that information. So LinkedIn, for me, provides multiple opportunities. Uh, the search function allows you to explore who are significant players within a specific industry, within a specific corporation. Um, if you have the basic service or maybe one step up uh, on the paid subscription, it, it allows you to look at different connection levels. So you can search who um, works at Price Waterhouse. You know, who are the managers at Price Waterhouse? What are the different categories of executives at a, at a particular company? And then you can do research as to who might be doing something you're interested in learning more about. And then you can reach out to them, send them a direct message, introduce yourself as a student uh, and ask, you know, can you spare 15, 20 minutes for me to just ask you some questions? Um, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to do that, okay? Especially in the current environment where people uh, have been displaced from their work environments and, and are working from home and their jobs and responsibilities have been uh, turned upside down in some respects. They're, they do have a little bit more time in many cases uh, so I think if they did receive a message from a student asking, uh, can I learn more about what you do and what types of opportunities are available at your company, I think you'd get more of a receptive audience than you might think. What would be a good keyword to entice somebody to engage with you or accept your invitation? Well, it, it really depends on the purpose of why you're looking to connect. So I think it has to be tailored to why you're interested in that person. Um, Paige, I, I noticed in your profile that you have significant experience in, ad, in the advertising industry. Um, I'm a junior at Fairleigh Dickinson in the Sil Silberman College of Business and advertising's of great interest. Would it be possible for us to schedule a, a 15, 20 minute call for me to ask you some questions about your career in advertising? Okay. And, and I, I would keep it brief and to the point. Okay. So on LinkedIn, there are some people that like to follow different companies. So if I was interested in advertising, I might want to follow IPG, or if I was interested in accounting, I might want to follow EY or somebody else. And then sometimes I notice there's a bunch of groups. What do the groups mean and how do I get involved? So groups are created by uh, a collection of like-minded people who either share an interest, share a profession, share a specific skill, and they like to communicate with each other, share best practices in their industry, share articles and research or uh, events, conferences. And sometimes they're very particular on who they let into their group. Uh, typically, let's say if it's a group of uh, orthopedists or, or you know, orthopedist uh, doctors, they typically only want people joining the group who have specific experience. However, there are groups that are more flexible, open to people outside of those um, specific skills. And if you know, as a student, I would, if you're interested in joining a particular group, uh, I would contact the, the person who manages the group and it'll indicate who they are. And you can send them a message. Again, um, I'm a student at the Silberman College of Business and Fairley, at Fairleigh Dickinson. I'm very interested in the area that your group 
uh, was founded on, would it be possible to allow me to participate in this group? Okay. So on the bottom of your screens, there's a reaction, right? There's a thumbs up or a hands clap. By, by the number of a thumbs up, how many of you actually have belonged to groups? Okay, so I would encourage you, a bunch of you, okay, great. So I would encourage the rest of you to start to look at the different groups to join because I will tell you that when I was in recruiting, the first place I would post my internships and some of my entry level jobs were right into those groups because I knew that there were a lot of hungry people there. So start to go through the groups that you would be interested in joining and there's not any limit of numbers, just make sure that it's relevant. That's what I would ask. All right, David, keep going. Yeah, so I, I see there's one question, uh, I'm not sure if I fully answered it, on any tips on how to manage the connections in LinkedIn um, or when inviting. Um, so like I said before, when you are messaging people on LinkedIn, especially people you've never met before or communicated before, I, I would start it with an introduction to explaining who you are and why you are communicating with this person. Because in many cases, they're getting a lot of solicitations, they're getting a lot of pitches, they're getting a lot of invites from people who are just looking to bulk up their connection bank. And I, I would just keep it very concise to the point and ask for some form of communication. Can we schedule a phone call? Uh, can I send you an email with some questions? Would that be okay? And that's a good way to start. Okay, so since we've been home, a lot of um, a lot of students have talked about how their parents have asked that they reach out to friends and relatives. I'm happy to talk to friends and relatives, but as a student, are they really going to help me? And what would be a good way to sort of figure out which is a good person I should really connect with versus somebody that I could be have a pleasant conversation with and then move on. Well, great question. And um, this is where uh, the more people you interact with and connect with, the more potential opportunities and knowledge and information you can get. So uh, I, I just want to kind of draw a comparison to, to a book that I know of. So there's a woman named Heidi Gardner. And she taught at Harvard Law School. And she wrote a book called Smart Collaboration. And it was mainly geared towards law firms about how collaboration makes them more, could make them more profitable and productive and efficient. And she talks about this notion of internal and external networks. So the internal network of the organization would be the people you work with. And quite often, people work with colleagues who have extensive networks and interesting people in, in close contact. And you may never discover that if you don't engage them and talk to them. And the external networks of the organization are the people that you would communicate outside of that. So now let's take internal and external uh, to you personally. So your internal network would be your friends and family. And you may have uncles and cousins and neighbors and friends, and they have a wide variety of network networks and relationships. But if you don't bring it up with them in a conversation or you don't ask about it, you know, I'm very interested in working at a public relations firm. Do you happen to know anybody who works at a public relations firm? You know, just starting it off that simply. Um, you never know where it's going to lead. It doesn't always have to be in a formal setting at, at a university event, at a networking event, at a conference. It, a lot of the relationships that I've built came through social contacts or just people I know. And in the course of conversation, they said, oh, you know, I have somebody you should talk to. In fact, that's how I got to Loeb Leadership. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was talking to a college friend about, you know, I went back to school and pursuing my career in executive coaching and leadership training. And, she, and this woman said, oh, I have the perfect person for you to speak to. You have to talk to Natalie Loeb. And she founded this leadership training and development company. So th this is where I encourage people to be proactive and engage. And, and it's, for some, it's very uncomfortable, especially if you're not an extrovert, uh, if you're not used to just 
starting a conversation or initiating the contact, it could be a little daunting. It could be somewhat intimidating. Um, if, if that is the case, then I would suggest starting out with an email or starting out with people who you trust and who are close confidants and just practice with them. Because uh, I, you know, again, in my opinion, I think it's invaluable to have the skills where you can engage and initiate a conversation and then carry that conversation. It's, it's an incredible life skill and it's a great business skill. So for how many of you, since you're home and you've looked at your resume, or I hope you've looked at your resume, Pat and I both hope you've looked at your resume, with regards to internships that either just ended or maybe ended in the fall, how many of those former colleagues have you connected with on LinkedIn? Think about that. So when David's talking about the people that you should continue to, to reach out to, virtually is a little bit harder than being at a tailgate party and, and talking to somebody. So think about the context of which the folks that you already know that maybe you haven't connected with on LinkedIn, or better yet, how to send an email. I'm just checking in with you at this time. Right, just think about that, just as a subject, checking in. I'm checking in to see how you and your family are. Okay, there are some additional questions. How do you manage solicitations? So what type of solicitation, Quinn, are you referring to? You're on mute. Can you unmute? Like people who are, I've been connecting with people who are into data analytics and data science. Uh, so I was just wondering how to manage them because they're trying to like, not like sell something like a software probably, or, you know, work or internship that I'm not really interested in, but I want to turn them down in a nicer way. So I just want to get, you know, uh, yeah. how to do that. Okay. Sure. So, so that, that's a, an excellent question. Um, when it comes to solicitations, if when I if I open up my my messages in LinkedIn and I see something that is completely sales, uh, it was not requested. I wasn't looking for it, and it's kind of just a total boilerplate message. I typically ignore it. Um, if it's somebody who writes me a personal message and they're offering a service or a product that I'm not interested in. I thank them for the message, I appreciate it, but at this time, um, uh, I'm not interested or it's not something I can consider at this point, but I'll certainly keep you in mind for the future. Another question is, Clayton wants to know, is it worth paying for the upgrade on LinkedIn? So Clayton, I think you might be referring to LinkedIn Premium. And if that's what it is, David, do you want to answer that? Sure. So again, it it's, depends on what you want to use it for. But I do think at least for a short time, you might be able to do a three-month subscription for the premium. They they may offer different categories, not for a full year. They, but they don't. We, they we're don't? looking into that from a student perspective. It's kind okay. of the challenge of the week. Well, they, I mean, it's... So I use the premium because it's it's necessary for my business. And primarily what premium lets you do, it lets you conduct searches outside of your, your first level connections. So you can search into second level and third level connections. So I have, as Paige said, I have about 8,500 connections, but more importantly, I have 8,300 followers. So those are people who made an effort to click on one of the articles I've written or one of the videos I've done. And that allows me to have greater visibility when I do post something. So um, I think the premium service uh, is worthwhile if you're gonna use it, if you're really gonna dedicate yourself and, and, and an effort to use it on a regular basis. Uh, You've probably heard it several times, you know, exploring an opportunity, looking for a job or, or advancing your career, in many cases is a full-time job. And it, using the LinkedIn, if you're only gonna use it once in a while or, or you, 
you know, let it sit for weeks and weeks, then it's probably not worthwhile. But if you're really committed to taking full advantage of the opportunity it offers, I, I think it's worth it. So this is where I'm going to say to the contrary. I think at, the, at this point in time, LinkedIn Premium is not worth it for you guys. You have free resources. One is Handshake, the other is Career Shift. So you should definitely start to look at those opportunities before you invest in LinkedIn Premium. If you get involved in the different groups, that will help. If you look at the people that I'm connected to, the people that, uh, within your own network or connected to, you can ask them to make your introductions and then it doesn't cost anything. But it goes back to Quinn's original email about how, how do you write the email? If you write an email, in my opinion, and this is where David and I differ in writing styles, short and to the point and a little pithy, I tend to get responses. When I was a recruiter and I was cold calling candidates, to talk to me about jobs, I would just entice them. And so now you're willing to put yourself out there and talk to people, as David said, about what they do. Why not say, I just want 10 minutes of your time. Can you give me 10 minutes? And more times than not, and David, I'm sure you would agree, 10 minutes turns into 20 or 25 minutes and Thanks. people love to talk about themselves. So if you ask them for just a little bit of time, you'll get a whole lot more, a whole lot more. So I think right now, look at Handshake and definitely look at Career Shift. Okay. And, and, and just uh, one other suggestion that came to mind. And I recently gave this advice to somebody who was a, a recent college graduate. And they were interested in private equity finance. And they were like, how do I find out about private equity finance? So I suggested to them, because I've done this for myself, is to Google private equity finance conferences. So what happens, the, a lot of professional service conferences, they post their programs online because they want to show off all the great people they got to come to their conference. So you can see who the thought leaders are, who the leaders in industry are in a partic particular discipline. And it gives their name, their position, their company. In some cases, it gives their email. It's free. It's up to date. It's current. And you get to see who are the major players in a particular area. And in many cases, when you search these conferences, you'll certainly find out that there's upcoming conferences. A lot of them now are gonna be virtual. So there may, they may offer uh, complimentary opportunities for students. They may offer significantly discounted rates. So now you can participate in some of these high level industry conferences, depending on what your, your focus is. And that provides a lot of information about what people do, the kind of work that they're involved in, and more importantly, how you can reach out and contact them. Okay, that's a good suggestion. So one of the questions is, can we join groups on Handshake? Unfortunately, Handshake doesn't have groups. It just has job postings and a lot of the events that FDU and more importantly, Silverman College of Business does. So the upcoming events include for next week, there's two virtual accounting workshops. So if you're interested in an accounting internship for next spring, and you're going to be doing the recruiting in the fall, we highly encourage you to sign up for one of the accounting workshop preps. Uh, I think there's one on Tuesday and Friday, right, Pat? Yeah, Tuesday and Friday of next week. Okay. So and, and just one other thing I want to say, just in the spirit of the, the concept of internal and external networks, you know, take advantage of, of Zoom. Invite friends and, and people you know to just a, a networking event through Zoom and let everybody talk about who they are, um, what their area of interest in, and who they might know that can help you in your particular area of interest. Because like Paige said, it could start, uh, uh, as, start out as a brief conversation and then develop into a conversation that spiders into different networks and opportunities and introductions. But I wholeheartedly endorse the notion of being proactive, reaching out, engaging people, and then telling them 
what you're interested in and seeing if they can help you advance the ball. So David, is there a difference between an informational interview and a casual conversation in your opinion? Yes and no. Um, I, I think from a, a perception and substance, an informational interview still has a little bit more of a formality uh, than a casual conversation. Uh, while you're not interviewing for a particular position that a company is hiring for, you still have to show up as if it is an interview. I, I still think the uh, you know presentation and engagement and active listening and all of the emotional intelligence qualities I coach executives about apply. Uh, I think it's very important to have a heightened sense of self-awareness, how you show up, how you're perceived by others, especially through video, because it's a little more difficult to read social cues, pauses in conversation. Uh, I think it's a great idea to record yourself and see if you have particular uh, nervousy type things. Um, do you stare down? Do you touch your face? Do you say, mm, and you know a lot? Hopefully I'm not doing that. Uh, you know, I, I think on video, your presentation, your personal presentation might be analyzed and scrutinized a little bit more. Um, however, the answer to your question is informational interviews uh, I think still have a level of formality than a casual conversation, but I think the notion still applies that you you get you don't get a second chance to make a first impression. So I think in both cases you still need to bring uh, your your best uh, self forward. Okay, so here's a good plug for Handshake. In Handshake, there's a module called Big Interview. I'm sure you've heard about that before. It's really important. Rep, Pat just put it in there. So in Big Interview. You can record yourself and delete it and record yourself again. And you can see that recording to see how you do. And you can never have enough practice. So definitely look to do that. And so, if I could just talk a little bit more about um, some of the emotional intelligence stuff when it comes to interviewing and having these conversations. You know, sometimes people get very nervous uh, in that setting, especially when it's with somebody they've never met before. And there's a technique called box breathing, and I highly recommend it for everybody. So box breathing is what Navy SEALs and special forces use to stay calm in very stressful situations. And you can Google it. There, there's a, a lot of YouTube videos on box breathing. And you get into this practice of breathing calming you, and it becomes a very natural exercise. And when you are in these stressful situations where you may be uncomfortable, it's something different and you're not used to, it's a good way to kind of bring your blood pressure down, your heart rate down, so you don't come across as somebody who's nervous or your anxiety is visible. Or you can do what I do and stick your two hands together and give yourself the fingernails in the palm of your hands to just keep your hands down. So yeah, I would follow my advice on that one. But, uh, <laughs> Are there other job boards besides LinkedIn and Handshake that you'd recommend? So David, yeah. you take a stab of it and then I have an opinion. No, too. I mean, there, there, there are so many. Um, I, I, I know some of them like uh, Glassdoor and Indeed and, and there, there are others. I'm not a big proponent of them because I don't necessarily use them. I think Paige would have a lot more to say about them and more experience. So there's... Two new websites, relatively new. One is called Career Rookie, and it's just that, Career Rookie. And I'll put them in the chat box. The other is called Way Up, W-A-Y Up. And then the Metro students know this, but I'll, I'll share this with all of you. Craigslist, I know it sounds crazy, but Craigslist actually has decent jobs because it only costs a company $25 to post on Craigslist. You'd obviously want to cross-reference and make sure it's a very reputable job. But for $25, a company can post and get 50 candidates versus going on Indeed and paying a lot more money and getting hundreds of candidates and having to go through them. So I will tell you that I had my last job before joining FDU. I worked for a company called Transact. I found them on Craigslist and they sold last spring for a billion dollars. So it's real companies, and I'll put those in the 
in the chat room. David, you know, most people are home now, getting maybe a little reminiscent about, you know, the good old days, and that could have been a year or so ago when we were able to go out and we were free to do things. And so you start thinking about people from your past. So is now a good time to reach out to my first boss from high school to say, hi, let's network. How can you help me? Um, yeah, I wouldn't start out with how can you help me, but I, 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 I think it's perfectly fine to reach out to people in your past or, or people you haven't talked to in a while. Um, and just, you know, certainly under these conditions, um, I, I have friends who've been reaching out to me just asking, I just checking in to make sure you and your family are okay. And, and then just from that, the conversation starts to snowball into what we've been up to, what we're doing personally and professionally. So I, I think it's, it's perfectly fine to do that. And a lot of people appreciate the, the, the care and concern um, by, by reaching out to people and, and asking. What's something you shouldn't be doing at this time from a networking perspective? Um, I wouldn't be pressing people um, because there's some folks who are highly stressed. Uh, there, there's general anxiety. I mean, just to give you an example. So at Loeb Leadership, my colleagues and I, we uh, issued a survey uh, primarily for the law firm industry. And we got a pretty wide response from around the country. And I think the results are applicable to any work environment. So what we found was that the three biggest challenges of people working remotely from home, uh, the first one was this feeling of general anxiety, the unknown, uh, not knowing if they have a job, not knowing if their current job is going to change and what their responsibilities are. The second biggest challenge indicated this sense of social isolation and loneliness and not being able to interact in person and engage with, with their colleagues and friends. And the third thing was difficulty communicating and engaging their team uh, in, in a productive, effective way to move projects and, and work forward. So I wouldn't, I, I'd give these people some time. So if you send an invite, if you send an email asking for a phone call or, uh, response to some questions. I, I would give it at least a week before I would follow up. I, I wouldn't keep pinging them. So I'd be mindful that uh, their people have serious things going on in their lives. Um, on the flip side, in times of crisis, there are opportunities. So I think there are opportunities for some people who may not be as busy as they used to be and might have more time to spend talking about careers and, and job specifications and, and ways to, to uh, advance your career search. When do you think is a good time to send an email or an invitation to somebody on LinkedIn? Is there a better time during the day or during the week than another? Not necessarily. I typically wouldn't do it first thing in the morning because people are getting up to speed. Uh, you know, I typically send those types of things after 10 in the morning. Um, yeah. I may give them Monday to get settled in and catch up on their work from the weekend. So Tuesday, Wednesday for me is probably prime time. Okay. What are your tips when connecting with people outside of the U.S.? Um, I, so in my experience, connecting with people outside the U.S., uh, certainly be mindful of the time difference, um, but also cultural differences. So there, and it may be difficult if you're not familiar with that culture, but if it's somebody in Europe or somebody in Asia, depending on what they do, I try to find people who are in your uh, network to ask questions about what's the best way to reach out to somebody in Hong Kong or somebody in London. And is, is there anything I should avoid or, or something I should certainly include. I'd be mindful of, I would catch up on some news in, in a particular city and see uh, what's going on there. If something um, serious has happened or uh, if there's just some notable event to bring up in, in conversation. 
Okay. So is it really just LinkedIn that we should be looking at? What about Instagram or tweeting or is there a way, and this might be out of your league, but using TikTok to somehow connect with and, and network to get a larger audience or to get us out there so we so people know who we are and we can engage them in meaningful dialogue about possible internships and or full-time jobs in the future? Sure. So I, I think thinking out of the box is great. Uh, I think utilizing all kinds of technology is great, but I'd also be real careful of not crossing a line of what's appropriate and not appropriate. Um, there are things that I've seen on people's social media on Facebook or, or Instagram that is not something they'd want a empl potential employer to see. Uh, for me, LinkedIn is more of a formal business professional environment. Um, typically, I in my LinkedIn feed, it's generally about updates in business or inspiring people or best practices or interesting articles and videos. Typically, there's no politics, there's no uh, videos of comedians and, and different types of things. I think Facebook and Instagram um, can be useful, but I would just, it's not something I use and I would just, I, I don't use it for business, but I, I would just caution that whatever you do that, you know, you, you'd be okay about if an employer saw it. Okay. How do you set yourself apart from others who want the same job? So that, that's an excellent question. And what I see now and what's really um, in demand in, in the, the business world is this increased sense of self-awareness, emotional intelligence, leadership skills. Uh, it's Companies are spending millions and millions of dollars in, in developing their workforce in these areas. I was at an event last year where the chairman of the law firm, Paul Weiss, one of the most prestigious firms in the world said, look, your IQ will get you an associate position here, but without high level emotional intelligence, you're not gonna be a partner here. And I, I think if somebody dedicates some time to taking a certification course in, in a leadership training in something like emotional intelligence. I think that shows a seri seriousness and a commitment, and it's certainly going to distinguish yourself from other people. Um, I, I think community service, public service also helps distinguish people. But if I could just refer to this one program, it's called the Leadership Challenge. It's a widely, widely used leadership training program in the business world. Uh, it was founded by two professors in California, Barry Posner and Jim Kuzis. And what they've broken it down to um, is that there's 30 leadership behaviors. And the leadership challenge evaluates and there's an assessment of how well you do these leadership behaviors. And it's not how well or not well you do them, but how often you do them. And the more you do them, the better you'll be. And out of over 3 million people who've taken the assessment for the leadership challenge, there's one behavior that's in the least frequent of over 90% of the people who take this assessment. And this is from individual contributors all the way up to the CEO. And the most frequent leadership behavior is asking for feedback asking for feedback, how my performance impacts you. So when you have these informational interviews, when you um, engage people to ask questions about their, their role and what they do, at the end of it, ask them some feedback about you. Be vulnerable saying, you know, is, is there anything I could have done better? Or, or next time when I'm meeting with someone, do you, re do you suggest that there's something I can do that would uh, strengthen my presentation and uh, how I how I show up. Great, thank you. How do you personally stay active in LinkedIn? How do I personally stay active? So I, I encourage everybody to to go view my profile. Uh, I post a lot of different things. So I recently was interviewed by a podcast uh, on leadership and emotional intelligence and how the pandemic has changed my worldview and my mindset. Uh, I interviewed a productivity expert on how to create efficient and productive workspace at home for people who aren't used to working remotely. I also write a lot of articles 
on a variety of topics involving leadership. I wrote an article that was published in the PLI Press called IQ versus EQ for attorneys, and um, it's gotten wide circulation. I also, I also I'm sorry, I'm going to interrupt you, but I've also pitched to him that he and I should write an article with our children about now that we're all home, how that really affects families. Don't you all think that would be a great idea? Yeah, that's more for, I think, group therapy page. Than no, to, uh, I, I think we should. Now, look at this. I mean, we, we, we got this, David. Okay. Oh, okay. No, but, but David, to his point, I'm sorry to cut you off, but I had to do that plug. Um, he's very active, and then he writes articles, and he comments on other people's, but it's an appropriate comment. It's not like, um, yeah, that's the way to go. It's, it's much more complimentary, like, referring back to maybe something that somebody's written or a specific uh, quote that somebody may have made in a video that they've posted. And it's engaged and, that way. And I also think it's important the way you structure the post. So what I do, if in my post, I'm referring to somebody, I tag their LinkedIn profile. I use hashtags. Um, I, I will tag organizations who I think might find my posting relevant. And in many cases, they like and share my post. So it gives it wider exposure. Typically, if I, I know I've posted something relevant when I get four to 5,000 views on it. And that comes with time. Yep. So what questions do you guys have? I know you have. And while, while we're waiting, I'll just mention one other thing that's really important, especially in times of uncertainty. Uh, there's a, a psychologist named Carol Dweck, and many of you may be familiar with her book, but she wrote a book called Mindset. And in a nutshell, she talks about two kinds of people. There's people with a fixed mindset, and there's people with a growth mindset. Now, people with a fixed mindset have a very narrow view of the world. They believe they know everything they need to know. They don't like stepping outside their comfort zone. They don't deal with failure well. They're not resilient. People with a growth mindset accept and embrace change as a constant. They look at failure as learning opportunities, um, like the Silicon Valley notion, fail fast and learn and learn from those mistakes and move on. Don't dwell on them, don't let it derail you, but demonstrate grit and resilience to come back from that. So uh, I highly recommend the book Mindset by Carol Dweck because uh, mindset is incredibly important in, in your outlook and your determination and, and not letting obstacles or challenges take you off path. In the spirit of networking, while you're thinking of questions, I will share with you that David and I actually met through networking. And it was one of my um, graduate school instructors that was his best friend that introduced us. So you never know where networking will get you and who you're gonna meet along the way. So here are some questions. What advice would you give to your younger self at the start of your career? Oi. Uh, with my wife on this? Um, no, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Uh, so that's an awesome question. Um, you know, it, it, I, I definitely took a long twisting journey, um, but I finally feel that I found what I was meant to do in life. Um, with Besides the work that, Mary May, that's yeah. just a side note. It's not about you, Paige, we're talking to the students. So, um, and, and it took a lot of uh, failures and challenges and successes and trying different things to, to learn what I like. Um, but the advice I'd give to my younger self would have been to be more broad in my perspective. Um, I started working for a law firm while I was in college as a legal assistant and then a paralegal, and I got very tunneled vision into this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to work at this firm. I'm going to go to law school. I'm going to be a lawyer, and that's what I'm going to do. And then, you know, well into my career and getting burned out and realizing this isn't what I want to do the rest of my life. So that I would have... I would have advised my younger self to have more of a growth mindset. I, I was kind of fixed. And I would encourage all of you to explore different professions, different opportunities. 
And, and if there's something that you like right out of the gate and you feel passionate about it, I would still explore other things because that just may reinforce the, your, your belief and, and connection to one thing in particular, or you may be exposed to something else that, you know, takes the place. Um, where can we get this leadership training you were referring to? Well, there's, there's so many different um, programs, but so there is a book called the leadership challenge. And, and I think it's a great book. And, uh, and, and I actually know Barry Posner personally. Um, he's an amazing individual who, who's done great work, but there's also here, here Here's another book that I highly recommend. It's a bestseller, it's a short book, and it's written by one of the foremost thought leaders in, in business consulting and leadership. And it's called The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And it's written by a gentleman named Patrick Lencioni, L-E-N-C-I-O-N-I, -I, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. And it's written in a story form. And out of The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, Patrick Lencioni has developed a program called the five behaviors of a cohesive team. And it's all about um, trust and conflict and uh, achievement and how to get teams to work effectively together. And it's a great leadership book, emotional intelligence collaboration book. Okay. Is using emojis and postings considered not professional? Um, I would keep emojis to things like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. I wouldn't use them per se on LinkedIn. Um, you know, I may be a little bit old school when it comes to this. Uh, I, I use them socially. I typically don't use them professionally. Okay. Is it polite to reach out to employees of businesses or companies of interest to ask them what challenges they're facing in the companies? This is just to know if one is preparing right to be a good candidate when the opportunities come. Yeah, I think that is actually something very valuable and helpful. I, again, my style would be to reach out to them in, in an email or a phone call, just introducing who you are and asking for 10 minutes, like Paige said, 10, 15 minutes of their time, and then introduce it in the conversation. Um, depending on the person, they may feel that that if you lay it all out in the email, they f might find it a little intrusive, especially if they don't know who you are. So I would keep it more broadly in the, intro in the introduction and the request. But then once you engage that person, you can get right into that. Would you include your resume when you do that? I would hold off on sending the resume unless they request it because that takes it to another level in my mind. If you're sending that email just as an introduction, hello, this is who I am, I'm a student, I'd really love to learn more about what you do. Um, I think that is a nice relaxed kind of introduction and engagement. I think once you send the resume, there might be a, just another layer. They may feel a little pressure that you're pursuing an opportunity. I would keep the initial contact very light. I, you know, it, it's a little hard, obviously, it, right now, living virtually. But if you were to reach out to somebody and sort of in a kitschy way say, you know, can we have a virtual cup of coffee? I think people would appreciate that and would break the ice a little bit and then have that conversation. And truly, if you wanted to have a cup of coffee while you're talking to them, know your audience and you may not want to do that if it's the first time you're talking to somebody but maybe it's a professor that you had last year or in the fall semester and you just want to reach out and pick their brain about something and, and on the same token if it, if you feel that it would be uncomfortable for you to have a one-on-one -on -one with someone like that maybe ask them would they mind having a, a coffee chat with a few of your classmates or a couple of your friends and make it more of a group uh, activity and this person can feel questions and, and talk more about what they do. Okay. What other questions do you have or comments? Do you feel like you're gonna hang up with us and you're gonna be able to start networking from your couch or your bed? Or do you think that you're going to really think about this and not so sure? 
I mean, one thing I'll, I'll offer out there if, you know, after this presentation, uh, hopefully you got something of value out of it. If you want to follow up, to ask me questions or to bounce something off me, certainly feel free to do that. You can um, send me a, a message directly on LinkedIn or connect with me, or you can send a, an email. I'll, I'll put my email in the chat and um, feel free to send me an email. Thank you, David. Thank you, Paige. That was amazing. And how great is David? He's letting you connect with him and ask him questions. Take him up on that. He really means it. That he does. That he does. All right. Any last questions before we wrap up? Okay. Have fun with networking. I know it's a little more challenging now, but really have fun with it because you don't know where it's going to lead. You really don't. And always ask those questions. And I wish everybody the best of luck. Stay safe. Stay well. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a good weekend. Bye. 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 Bye.